of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. A virgin Mary's babe was born below a starry beam. And on the bed of hay, in a manger where he lay, as the star did shine so brightly on this day. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy. Bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy. Bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. The prophecy foretold that he be named Emmanuel. He'll save us and protect us. As the prophet did foretell, the shepherds and the sheep gathered near the babe asleep, as the wise men brought their gifts to share and keep. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy, bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy. Bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. And so it was quite true, beneath the sky so very blue. The star kept shining brightly, and for those who saw him knew that the newborn king shall give peace and love to everyone, and with glory and with honor to God's Son. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy, bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. Bringing tidings of great joy, holy child and baby boy, bringing tidings of great joy on Christmas Day. Today's Gospel comes from the book of Mark, the first chapter at the fourth verse. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our first lesson comes from the book of Genesis, the first chapter at the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. The first day. Our second lesson comes from the book of Acts, the 19th chapter at the first verse. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, 
the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. Our Gospel from Epiphany comes from the book of Matthew, the second chapter at the first verse. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I might also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, sisters and brothers. The title of our message for this uh, celebration of Epiphany and also for the baptism of our Lord is uh, Epiphany, the heavens torn open. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, sisters and brothers, this week we make a big transition in the Christian calendar from the season of Christmas, which is not just a day in the church calendar, it's 12 days, it's a season. And so this Wednesday, January 6th, we transitioned from uh, the season of Christmas to the season of Epiphany. And Wednesday, January 6th, every year is the day, the feast of Epiphany. So that day we put away our Christmas trees and all of our Christmas decorations and we enter the new season. It's the 12th day of Christmas and the day of Epiphany, the day when we remember the journey of the Magi following the star and worshiping the Christ child when they find him. So in um, the, the, the Greek New Testament, the word Epiphany uh, means what? In, in common usage, we talk about, oh, I had an epiphany, and we mean an aha moment, right? Um, we, we talk about a moment where we see something that we hadn't been able to see before, and it's, it's an aha moment. Everything becomes clear, and it's like all the pieces of a jug, jigsaw puzzle come together, and everything makes sense. We have this revelation. Uh, the word in Greek of the New Testament is epiphaneo, uh, is the verb, and it means uh, to show forth, to manifest, to reveal something. So an epiphany is a showing forth, a manifestation, a revelation. And in the early church, uh, when they put together the Christian calendar, 
they actually celebrated a trinity of events, three events on this feast day of Epiphany. They celebrated the birth of Christ. They celebrated the journey of the Magi who worshipped and adored uh, the Christ child. And they celebrated the baptism of our Lord. They put all these three together because they felt in these three different events, um, God manifested for us, uh, showed forth, revealed who the Christ is. Now, of course, the birth story of Christ, right, where the heavens are opened and the angels announce to the shepherds, unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord, and then the angels joined by the whole heavenly host, praising God and saying to glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among all those whom God favors, okay? So that's the first manifestation, right? Christ's birth. And the shepherds run and see this child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Um, but we've already talked about that uh, epiphany or manifestation, right, at Christmas. So today we're going to focus on the other two manifestations of who this Christ is. Um, and we're going to look at the journey of the Magi first and then the baptism of our Lord, okay? So the journey of the Magi is uh, the gospel that you heard read from Matthew chapter 2. It's only told in the gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it says, in those days, after the birth of Christ, Magi from the east came. And... Um, the reason I, I want us to unpack this a little bit, the reason why I, I do not use the word wise men, but use the word magi instead, is because in the New Testament, in the Greek language, the text actually in Matthew says magoi, magi. Um, and although this is a weird word to us, and the only time we ever hear this word is in this story of Epiphany, uh, to the early Christians, um, and Matthew's writing to Jewish Christians, to the early Jewish Christians, um, magi would be a word they would be familiar with. And that is because um, when the Jews were in exile, after uh, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom was destroyed in 586 BCE by the Babylonians, all the priests and the leaders, the elite of the people, were taken into exile in Babylonia, okay? Now, they were in exile there for 50 years. And that is where Bible scholars believe they actually, these religious leaders had a lot of time on their hands, and that is when they actually wrote down the sacred texts that we today call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament because they had a lot of time on their hands in exile, 50 years, right? So they spent that time um, writing down from the oral tradition these uh, manuscripts, these uh, accounts of our faith, of the Jew Jewish faith that we come out of as Christians, and that's the texts of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. But the people of Babylonia, the people of that whole region, were their major religion was Zoroastrianism. And um, at the end of the time of exile there, the Babylonians, who'd been keeping the Jews in captivity, were conquered by the Persians. And the Persians, again, major religion, Zoroastrianism. And it says in the Hebrew prophets that King Cyrus, the, the Persian king, after the Persians conquered the Babylonians, he set the Israelites free. And he said, you can return to your homeland, Israel, right? 
You can return to Jerusalem. You can rebuild your temple. And he even gave them some financial support and helped them to rebuild. So he is called in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Messiah, which means the anointed one, um, this Zoroastrian king, this Persian king. Um, and uh, so the priests, the holy people, the spiritual leaders in Zoroastrianism are called Magi. So the Jews who'd been in exile for 500 years in Zoroastrian territory would have heard, would know what the, what the name Magi referred to these spiritual leaders, these priests of Zoroastrianism. And I also do not call them wise men because in Zoroastrianism, women as well as men can be priests or spiritual leaders. So there were certainly women among the Magi. Every year in our Christmas pageant, when um, the girls want to be Magi, um, I always say, um, certainly because the Magi were female as well as male. So a second thing we need to unpack with this story of the journey of the Magi is that there were not just three of them. That's later Christian legend, um, but there was probably a huge entourage of Magi with servants and guards because three wealthy, educated spiritual leaders carrying treasure for months long journey across the Arabian desert, several hundred miles would not travel three people alone with this large treasure. No, they would have a big entourage in their caravan and many guards, people with weapons protecting them. Um, and recently an ancient document was found called the Revelation of the Magi and um, it's a young man, Brent Landau, from Harvard Divinity School, is working, just published this book, is working on translating this ancient manuscript. And it's all about the journey of the Magi, and it supports or corroborates this idea that there was a large entourage, not just three. We've also talked a lot about the star, the star of Bethlehem, and what does that mean? And just this year, we had this conjunction of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, um, which unfortunately was clouded over for us, but uh, many say that that also took place around the time of Christ's birth, so that could be what was referred to as the star of Bethlehem. Other theories are that it was Halley's Comet, which also appeared around that time. And in many pieces of art of the Nativity, you'll see a comet over the manger. And a third theory is that it was a supernova, an aged star that dies and in its death gives birth to many new stars. But in this book, The Revelation of the Magi, even though Magi were also scientists and astronomers and astrologists, uh, and so did study the stars and the heavens, um, in this book, it, it shows some ancient works of art which depict the star of Bethlehem as actually being Christ himself, Christ the light of the world, who we call our morning star. And so there's artwork of the star that they're following and in the star is a picture of the infant Christ. And in some works of art, it's in the star is a picture like this one of Christ grown carrying uh, a cross. Okay, great book to, to look at. Um, so a further thing to unpack from this story of the Magi is that they're on a journey and it's a journey, it's symbolic of our life journey back to our source, our journey to follow God, to find God in our lives as the Magi left everything behind and embarked on this incredible journey following the light and until they found the Christ child. And then when they find him, they bow down, they worship him, they adore him. 
and they offer him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they're symbolic gifts. Gold is a gift befitting a king, Christ the king of kings. Frankincense, incense, a gift one would give a priest, and he is our great high priest. Myrrh, uh, uh, an aloe type um, uh, ointment that was used to anoint people after they had died. And of course, we know that Christ died uh, for his great love for this world, to save this world. So those three very symbolic gifts. And, um, and so a final thing we need to talk about from this epiphany story is that the Magi thankfully were wise and um, did not fall for Herod's um, scheme because King Herod is sort of like the dark cloud hanging over this feast of Epiphany, which is all about light. Herod says to them, well, when you find this, uh, this Christ, this anointed one, which means king, when you find him, bring me word so that I too may go and worship him. And of course, he intended to kill this child. So the Magi, it ends in Matthew to 12 by saying they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod so they returned to their home by a different path or route and um and thankfully and then Herod is very angry when he finds out he's been duped by the magi and he sends his henchmen to slaughter all of the little children two years old and younger in Bethlehem and does this horrific uh, deed of murder uh, called the slaughter of the holy innocents and celebrated in the Christian calendar on December 28th. And um, so Herod represents this darkness juxtaposed to the light of Epiphany. And he was a great um, king uh, externally he brought um, a lot of order to these people of Israel who were really down and out. They'd been oppressed for many years. Um, and he also did these incredible building projects. He built himself this lavish temple. He restored the holy city of Jerusalem, making it this beautiful gem of a city. And he restored the temple that Solomon had built a thousand years before him and then had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE when they exiled the Israelites. And when King Cyrus, the Zoroastrian Persian, let them return and let them rebuild the temple, there were, they were so few in number and they, there was such devastation that the temple was very paltry compared to the first temple of Solomon. And so Herod, who was part Jewish, wanted to restore it to its original brilliance and did so. However, it was destroyed again in 70 CE. But anyway, so in some ways, Herod was this great and successful king, but he was a psychopath. He um, murdered anyone who he um, saw as a threat to his throne, including his beloved wife, Mariamna, who um, he loved. And after he killed her, then he spent the rest of his life grieving her loss. He also killed two of his own sons because he felt they were a threat to his throne. So really a dark uh, character, a troubled, psychopathic person. Um, and so this story of the Magi is a symbolic for us and for our lives, okay? Who are the Magi in our own lives? Who are those messengers who come and invite us to begin our quest, our journey to find God and to find this Christ child? What is that star, that light that leads us in our lives? Hopefully also it's Christ, the morning star, the light of the world. Um, as the Magi didn't 
travel in a few numbers, they traveled in a large group. Who are the people in our group that keep us uh, on our journey, on our quest, and hold us accountable in our own lives? Um, when they found the Christ child, right, they worshiped and adored him and gave him these gifts. Well, what gifts do we bring to the Christ? What gifts do we use to honor and worship him in our own lives? And then finally, um, as we're called to share that light of Christ, what dark clouds are hanging over our lives today that prevent us from sharing this light of Christ? So those are some thoughts and, and messages from this epiphany story and this journey of the Magi. But today in the Christian calendar, we also celebrate the baptism of our Lord. And so it's a moment too for us to think about baptism and what that means in our lives. And the first reading we heard from Genesis is about um, the creation uh, of the, in Genesis of the first day and the wind, the Holy Spirit, the breath of life hovering over the waters of creation and bringing forth new life. The second reading um, from the book of Acts tells that in the early church, many who were baptized by John had not even heard of the Holy Spirit, so they are rebaptized into Christ and it says that the Holy Spirit then came upon them. And then the third uh, reading, the Gospel from Mark 1, is the story of Jesus' baptism. And it says that at the moment of his baptism, the heavens were torn open. See, epiphany again. There's this manifestation, this showing forth, this revelation of who Christ is, and the Holy Spirit descends as a dove, a symbol of peace in the Bible, and, uh, and Christ is anointed by the Holy Spirit, and the voice of God says, Behold my beloved Son, listen to him. So um, Wednesday, the day of Epiphany, I had very mixed feelings. I woke up and I had my morning prayer and I read the story of the Magi, which I love. So it was a beautiful day. And one of our eldest members, Ann Kilgus, had her 95th birthday on Epiphany. So I was thinking and praying for her. But also my father's funeral was on Epiphany Day seven years ago. So I, I had mixed feelings. With, I was feeling sad about him. And I went for a walk with my sister, Leslie, because uh, she also had these same mixed feelings. And as I went to her home to pick her up, she came running out to the car and said, you've got to see this. What's the news? It's unbelievable. Our, our capital is, is being attacked by these rioters, these these terrorists, um, and they're smashing down the doors and they want to harm our, our political leaders and this is awful. And I came in and I we were we were just horrified. We couldn't believe the news. And so that reminds me of that dark cloud, right, in our world today. Um, it, uh, as we celebrate this feast of light. And um, so for us, sisters and brothers, I was reminded of, of September 11th and the darkness of that day that faced our nation. And uh, that happened on a Tuesday. And that following Sunday, I had arranged to do a baptism of a beautiful little girl adopted from China named Lucy. And when I met with her family, it turns out they'd been living in their own darkness. They were going through a lot of grief because the mom, Lucy's mom, uh, her 38-year-old brother had died completely unexpectedly in his sleep of like an aneurysm, I believe. And so the family begged me, they said, we just ask one thing at Lucy's baptism, can you not mention anything difficult, nothing painful or sad or tragic we want it to be all about joy and happiness and light because this family's been through enough tragedy. So I said, absolutely. 
And then the Tuesday before Lucy's baptism, September 11th happened. I mean, how could I not talk about that? And this week was a similar uh, event. On the very day of Epiphany, how can we not talk about that? But it's interesting that our elected officials decided to uh, reconvene later that same day after the attack on the Capitol. And they began with a prayer. Uh, one of our leaders began with um, a prayer and mentioned, she said, today is the day of Epiphany. And in my Christian faith, she bore witness to her faith. She said, um, uh, we pray the prayer of St. Francis, which of course is this great prayer for peace. So I, um, I urge all of us, sisters and brothers, as we make this transition from the season of Christmas to the season of Epiphany, um, as we live in a world filled with both light, the light of Christ, and also darkness, deep darkness, I pray that we can be um, examples of that light, that we can share that light of Christ. After September 11th, when I baptized little Lucy, whose name means light, I lit her baptismal candle from the Christ candle, and I said to this tiny little girl in her kimono that her uncle, who had died, just died at age 38, had given to her for her baptism, I said, Lucy, whose name means light, may your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And sisters and brothers, that is what I wish to say to you this day. This day when we celebrate the baptism of Christ, the light of the world, may we go forth in our lives and bear that light of Christ into the midst of the darkness of our world today. May we be that light of Christ we long to see in this world. And may, may we remember that Christ, the light of the world, goes with us and is the light that no darkness can overcome. Amen. From heaven above to earth I come to bear good news to every home. Glad tidings of great joy I bring whereof I
And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.